Well, I'm uh, Miroslav Shkandri, Miroslav Shkandri, and uh, my book is uh, Avant-Garde Art in Ukraine, 1910 to 1930, Contested Memory. So this is, this is the, the book. Well, for many years, ever since I finished my uh, dissertation, which was uh, a long time ago, I've been interested in the avant-garde. I studied the 1920s, but mostly the literature and the debates around art. And since then, I have um, written various articles about avant-gardists, or avant-garde literature, avant-garde art. I noticed that um, these could be brought together in, a, in book form. Um, and so I added some new articles, some uh, research, some new individuals, uh, and try to put together a, a sort of um, an introduction to the avant-garde, Ukrainian avant-garde, but focusing on, uh, on the arts rather than the literature. One important reason why I did this was because over the course of my career, um, I constantly came up against this idea that the avant-garde was Russian. And uh, these various individuals were always mentioned as Russians, you know, the, uh, the Russian avant-gardists, um, including, you know, Archipenko and Burlyuk and Malevich, and I was surprised to learn that these people actually were Ukrainian, said they were Ukrainian, and uh, identified themselves as such. So uh, I felt there was a need to answer scholars and researchers and to provide some information to, to just the general reader about the existence of, of the avant-garde. The other part of it was that uh, there were connections between these individuals. In fact, many of the greatest avant-gardists were Ukrainian and said they were Ukrainian and said their inspiration was Ukrainian. So um, when I looked at people um, who, uh, who uh, tried to explain their avant-gardism, I also found that there was this sort of Ukrainian dimension to it. So. Uh, I tried to produce a book which, in the first half, it gives you kind of overviews. One overview is Ukrainian avant-gardists, Ukrainian artists in Paris and Western Europe. Another, another chapter is devoted to the Jewish Ukrainian avant-garde, Jews and Ukrainians and their interaction, which was very interesting, very important in the early 20s. Uh, the politics of the avant-garde which was an, also a, an interesting aspect. And then the second half of the book is case studies. So I looked at, you know, major figures, uh, Boychuk, Burlyuk, Malevich, Kavaleridze, Meller, uh, Zygavertov. And in that way, I tried to cover, uh, or at least, you know, find, place certain individuals uh, in this broader context of the avant-garde, so people could navigate the, um, the Ukrainian avant-garde. And I also tried to cover different genres, so the poster, uh, art, uh, film, sculpture, um, and, and in that way uh, give, a, give a kind of a, produce a map for our future scholars to, uh, to follow. I was surprised uh, when I started working on this many years ago, but I was surprised at how much Ukrainians contributed to futurism, uh, monumentalism, suprematism, theater art, documentary filmmaking, all within this kind of avant-garde dynamic. And I felt that that needed, that needed some exposure. So rather than have uh, a few articles which tend to get lost, uh, uh, I thought I'd put together a book uh, which could stay on a shelf and help uh, students uh, or, or interested individual, individuals find their way uh, to this art. I mean, we could just say that they just don't know. That unless, you, unless you explain to people uh, why, why you think these people are Ukrainian, 
Um, and what makes them Ukrainian? Why should people think any differently? So there, there's sort of a weight of weight of uh, tradition behind this discussion, and uh, and uh, you just have to produce the facts. You just have to give them that information. Uh, so Burulyuk, for example, was extremely proud of the fact that he was Ukrainian. He underlined it everywhere, at every opportunity. Um, he. Uh, uh, well, you have to read my article on Borluk in the book, but he was, he talked about his, his art itself as being Ukrainian, his background as being Ukrainian, Cossack bones, you know, he was from, claimed to be of Zaporozhian origin, even in the family, um, which came from the Sume area, in, um, or, or lived for a long time in the Sume area of Ukraine, in the family, there was even the, the, the sort of myths about uh, the family origins. Uh, his, uh, you know, the famous Repin painting of the Zaporozhians writing a letter to the Sultan of Turkey. Well, that semi-naked Cossack in the painting, um, family tradition had it that that was the father of Burluk who posed for that. And when he was in, uh, in Japan, uh, Burluk traveled across Siberia during the revolution uh, and ended up in Japan for two years with uh, his, uh, his friend Fiala, uh, a Czech uh, painter. And uh, Fiala produced a, um, a family tree, which shows you at the bottom of the Zaporo, this is a huge Zaporozhian at the bottom, uh, this, this, uh, this warrior and the tree goes off in different directions. And, you know, you can see that uh, this was Burluk giving Fiala the information that, that he, he was rooted in Ukraine. I mean, the, this, the, the biography is, the, the, there have been biographies published of, of Burluk, and it's quite clear from this. Obviously, if, if, if uh, other scholars, say, in, in Moscow or uh, other places are writing about this, they will give a different spin to it. So that's where you get the contested memory. This is one of the, the questions that I get asked a lot and keeps coming up for obvious reasons. Uh, I, I, can, I can identify three questions. The why? Why did this Ukraine avant-garde appear? I mean, that's a fascinating question in itself. Secondly, what was Ukrainian about it? I get asked a lot that question. And thirdly, was it an avant-garde? I mean, what might, what's an avant-garde? So these are three themes that run through the book. Um, I, I pick them up and I sort of answer them in different ways in, in different places. And I think for a, for a reader who's, uh, who's curious, they'll find answers to this throughout the book. Well, why the avant-garde, I think, is, is, a, is a question in itself. Ukrainians embraced modernism. And for people that think of Ukrainians as sort of a backward, rural, peasant nation, this is a surprise. But Ukrainians were in Europe, they were in Paris and Munich and Berlin and Vienna. They sent their uh, young youth to finish schooling there. They were part of that avant-garde at the beginning of the century, the explosion of interest in modernism and the avant-garde. And so they were open to new experiences. They, they thought they were, they felt they were bringing uh, a new uh, sensibility and, a, and, a, and a, a, a novelty to European and international culture. There was a sort of creative elan at the time. And Ukrainians embraced this, um, this new art. So that's one reason. Uh, another reason is the politics. Revolution of 1905, revolution of 1917, a sense that Ukraine was finally able to uh, take its place at the European table and show what it could do. You know, politically, it was, there, there was a, a, um, a push 
towards describing Ukraine uh, as a, as a, a young, uh, uh, up and coming nation that, that, that has things to offer. So that's the why. The other part that, that you asked, uh, the Ukrainianness, that's a little more difficult to answer. Um, I, I usually do it in, by, by posing three questions of my own. First of all, why did Ukrainians self-identify as Ukrainians? These artists said they were Ukrainian. Now, that alone should interest people. Why is it that uh, they, they were so insistent uh, that they were influenced by uh, the country, the culture, uh, the place they came from? Um, and, and they did. I mean, sometimes it's an ambiguous statement, but all of them, uh, uh, um, these, these individuals, all of them in one way or another did. Second part of it is they, con they were in contact with one another. So even when Ukrainian artists were in Paris uh, or in Berlin uh, or in Moscow, uh, if they came from Ukraine, they often they had radar for one another. They found one another. They interacted. They did joint projects together. So they became, if you want to call it that, they became part of a Ukrainian milieu or a Ukraine a pro a process an art process uh, that was that was um, a, a movement that was uh, Ukrainian, um, and uh, the other part of it, and probably the most difficult part of, exp of, of of to establish, is how how is their art Ukrainian? Well, you can answer it in different ways. Uh, the avant-garde, by definition, was very varied. Everybody was trying experiments in different directions. Uh, but I tried to show certain things that were, as you said, different from Russian or Western European avant-garde, or special, or some emphases. Um, so one of them, it's not just me, it's, it's the artists themselves that pointed it out. One of them was the fascination with color. Now, I, some, I sometimes get criticized for saying this, but it wasn't me who said this. It was Légère in, in Paris. It was Alexandra Exter. Uh, it was Sonia Deloney. Ukrainians sort of poured brilliant color into Cubism, into the sort of monochrome early Cubism. And the, the sort of this became, uh, in some ways, a, um, a calling card. They were also really interested in folk primitivism. Uh, they had a special uh, relationship to folk primitivism. Uh, in Ukraine, I mean, it, it was, primitivism was uh, popular uh, in the second decade of the uh, 20th century, but, and Ukrainians sort of rode that wave. But they only had to go to the to the village next door next door to where they lived or to to their to their relatives to see how explosive and creative this art produced by local people by artisans was. They had this sort of special interest, and they they used it. They uh, uh, they felt that they had something special to offer. So folk primitivism was another big uh, part of, uh, of the kind of Ukrainian brand. Um, and it was a little different. Even, even, uh, even their um, interest in the avant-garde was more an interest in, in a, a, finding a harmony, finding a harmonious view of the world. So change the world, upset the table, um, uh, you know, do something different, but find a, a deeper harmony. So there was this interest in, for example, in, in the very archaic, the very old, uh, even the mystical. Uh, when you look at Archipenko or you look at Burluk, uh, there's a certain sort of mysticism uh, and, and, a, and a fascination with, the, with the, the, the very, very distant, even with the cosmic. Uh, Ukrainians had that uh, in spades. Uh, which is not entirely different from some other avant-garde, but it was very strong uh, in 
in among Ukrainians. And also uh, in the politics, they were less political in the in the sense that they were, um, uh, you know, they didn't have these sort of marching throngs, these marching phalanxes of of of, uh, of soldiers, which is sometimes associated with the Russian avant-garde, you know, the Bolshevik sort of trend in uh, in the avant-garde. Um, they were more interested in exploring uh, a culture that they felt had been suppressed, had not been uh, given exposure. Their attitude was, uh, let's rediscover this, this At- Atlantis, this, this civilization that is, has been lost, that is just beneath the surface that we need to rediscover. So it was more, it was more that approach then let's conquer nature, let's overcome nature. In fact, Ukrainians were more interested in nature itself rather than the machine, rather than the city, more interested in the processes of nature. Uh, and a sort of a, there's an organic feel to a lot of the art. Now, I don't want to say that everybody did this um, because it was a, a wide ranging movement, but. Um, uh, if you look at sort of emphases, there's a, there's more of that, uh, particularly in the in the uh, in the pre-revolutionary and the uh, the period leading up to the uh, early twenties. After the early twenties, it became more political. People had to make more concessions to what um, Bolshevik rule demanded. Well, I think for a lot of people, it's still uh, a discovery and exploration. And I think many people view the book as precisely that. That's that's what it was. It's not supposed to be the last word. It's supposed to uh, stimulate uh, people to discover things. Um, I've had some questions asked, you know. Why do you think Boychuk, for example, why do you include Boychuk as an avant-gardist? He shouldn't be there, uh, this kind of thing. Or there are kind of questions asked about, um, uh, you know, can you really say it was an avant-garde? Because in people's minds, the avant-garde means something rather different. You know, they see it as in, a, in much more political terms. So what I've just said about it being sort of focused more on organic nature and so on goes against some particular views of the avant-garde. I think that that's um, that's being too uh, too narrow-minded. I think it's uh, uh, it by definition it's a, a wide-ranging movement. Um, but I also say another thing: uh, the avant-garde, the Ukrainian avant-garde. I mean, it was viewed the the, the, two, the term itself was viewed as a, a, an oxymoron, something not possible. About 1990, people began to discover the potential, the possibility of a Ukrainian avant-garde, and this term Russian avant-garde suddenly in the 1990s became. Uh, I, I started noticing that it was described as a Russian-Ukrainian avant-garde. In other words, these people were both part of the Russian avant-garde and the Ukrainian avant-garde. And more recently, it has now been dis- described strictly as a Ukrainian avant-garde. I think that's, uh, you know, that's fair. I mean, these people, some of these people contribute. They lived in Russia uh, for parts, a large part of their lives, and they contributed to the Russian avant-garde. Uh, they lived in Western Europe. They contributed to the École de Paris, to the French uh, or the Western European avant-garde. Um, the Jewish artists, Jewish Ukrainian artists, lived in in Kiev, but then sometimes moved to Moscow, to Warsaw, to Berlin, and they contributed to those avant-gardes. So um, they were part of an international phenomenon. And they can be claimed by different different uh, um, countries or different traditions or different avant-garde. It's that's 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 fair. It's not that 
It's not that they strictly have to be uh, described one way, but that inspiration and that origin in Ukraine um, should be recognized. I think it's important. In fact, I don't think you can understand them without that. And there are many connections, even if you look, and I, I have a couple of articles in the book about the Jewish avant-garde, the Kulturliga in particular in the 1920s in Ukraine. There, there are many, they were a separate group, but there are many uh, points of intersection and many analogies to other groups, other the Ukrainian avant-gardists, for example. Those Jews, and Ukrainians went to the same schools, uh, graduated from the same uh, art colleges, uh, interacted, met, uh, usually initially at uh, Alexandra Exter's studio, um, and they were part of the same uh, movement. In fact, the, uh, the Jewish artists very often had this interest in the archaic, the, the ancient, and used that to create the new, the modern, the avant-gardist. So they went into their past, into their deep sort of, they were looking for a deep grammar, if you want to call it that, of their own tradition. And Ukrainians, particularly the Boychuk school, the monumentalists, did the same. In fact, uh, you know, there was a quite a large group of Jews within Boychuk's school of monumentalism, who were doing Jewish themes, working on Jewish themes, uh, um, exploring Jewish traditions. So this this was part. This was in the air. It was part of um, uh, of a of a movement uh, where different groups uh, rubbed up against each other and learned from from one another. The, these things need just further exploration, but they they are beginning to. Uh, they're beginning to be understood, I think, more widely. After 2000, we actually did, uh, in Winnipeg here, we did a big exhibition, The Phenomenon of the Ukrainian Avant-Garde. We brought all these works from the Kiev National Museum and we showed them and then it, uh, the exhibition traveled. We did the same thing with uh, Burluk's works, uh, many of which are in Canada because his granddaughter lives in, in Canada, so this exhibition also traveled. So after about 2000, you start seeing books appear, uh, and then all of a sudden there's an explosion, uh, particularly, in, particularly in Ukraine. And all of a sudden, I think in the last years, this avant-garde has become sort of a, a Ukrainian brand even. They had a debate about what to name the airport in Kiev. Uh, they decided on Sikorsky, but the second uh, choice or the, the second most votes was to call it the Malevich airport. So, you know, I mean, all of a sudden Ukrainian avant-garde has become sort of a, a calling card. Uh, there's a book just being published on Dmitro Donsov and on the cover they have Burluk's Cossacks. Now, I don't know, Dontsov might be turning over in his grave if he, if he saw that. But it just shows you that the, the classic images of the avant-garde are now widely accepted in, U in the Ukrainian tradition. And uh, even, more, even more broadly, I mean, the Ecole de Paris uh, has done exhibitions of you know, Jewish uh, artists in, in Paris, Russian artists in Paris now Ukrainian artists in Paris. Uh, and this is now, this has now become, uh, you know, widely accepted, w widely known. I only found out recently that Picasso's first wife was Ukrainian. He, he never divorced her. Chochlova. You, you, you can find, uh, it, it's now, the photographs are now and f on Facebook. They're, they're coming up everywhere with Picasso in his embroidered Ukrainian shirt with his beautiful uh, Ukrainian wife. So uh, it's now becoming sort of uh, acceptable. And uh, it's opened up the possibility for scholars, for researchers to go more deeply into this. 
uh, this phenomenon. But I do take uh, issue with people who oppose the idea of even mentioning or describing the Ukrainian roots or the Ukrainian inspiration behind a certain uh, a certain individual. It's uh, I think it's just a question of explaining uh, something that uh, uh, for for some scholars is an, is a, is is not known. And um, it's a job of U Ukrainian researchers to uh, bring this to light and just make it's just it just makes them more interesting, I think. Well, I think painting painting was uh, the number one, but they were also uh, very, very interested in uh, sculpture and they were very good at it. There was also this kind of uh, artisanal quality. Um, many of these people uh, came out of uh, a tradition of, um, you know, work, woodworking or um, uh, peasant crafts. They they were avant-gardists. They were part of the intelligentsia, but they had close contacts, and they actually interacted with these uh, with these peasant collectives. In fact, the the suprematists, Malevich's group um, had a uh, ha had established contact with two uh, village collectives which they developed uh, village women artisans textile workers and so on for whom they uh, produced suprematist designs which these people made and then sold internationally uh, they organized exhibitions for these artists um, and uh, in major cities. So there was this sort of artisanal quality and interest. And that's, that's very, uh, that's, I think, special to, uh, to, to the, the Ukrainians because they were explorers. They were, they were looking in different media and different ways of, of doing things. I mean, Arkhipenko was the first person to do these strange sculptures, which he then painted. I think he was the face, first cubist Painted, uh, painted sculptures were the first uh, to be done by Archipenko. Um, th they, were, they were good in different areas. But the other thing that should be perhaps mentioned is that uh, because of the political changes, the political pressures, um, their art had to adapt. Kavalridza, in my, in my interpretation, is an, is an excellent example. It began as a, in pre-war, pre pre First World War years uh, as a sculptor, uh, looking into history, the the, the history of the uh, Kiev and Rus, uh, the the great leaders. You know, he went on to become a avant-gardist artist in the twenties with his famous uh, strange Artem um, uh, sculptures of 1924, 1926. But then uh, with the, he survived, he, he, he continued to be a sculptor, but he had to change. So he, he had to do these sort of uh, socialist realist um, uh, monoliths later in life. And you can actually trace uh, uh, the development by looking at how he adapted, how, he, how his art changed. And if you look at his art, it tells the whole story of the 20th century. Um, I'll give you just one example. There is a massive seven-story uh, sculpture that he made in Slovyansk, right on the border of what is today the uh, Donetsk People's Republic and uh, Ukraine. It's on the Ukrainian side. It overlooks uh, the the river it's huge um, and it was produced uh, 1927 I believe and at that time it was a uh, it was a monument to the Ukrainian worker the the communist worker it was then renamed several times uh, and it became uh, a, a monument now to Ukrainian Ukrainians and the Ukrainian worker Kavalidza was initially a huge uh, success and uh, embraced by the Bolsheviks. 
Then he was criticized, and his Artem monument, one of the most brilliant monuments of the uh, of the avant-garde, was dismantled. In fact, this monument is part of the Zygavertov's film, plays a big role in his film enthusiasm, but it was taken apart. Then there were attempts to take down this second monument that I've mentioned, the Slovensk monument. <coughs> it survived, however. When the Germans, when the Nazis invaded, they thought this monument was an example of degenerate art, so they fired cannon at it to try and bring it down. You can still see the pockmarks of the, uh, where the cannon hit it. They failed to knock it down. It survived. There were attempts to bring it down again because Khrushchev decided that um, Kavalaritsa was a degenerate artist, uh, avant-gardist. And today, it's still there. And it, now it symbolizes Ukrainian endurance and resistance, looking out across to the Donetsk Rep People's Republic, so-called. Uh, so the, the, the art itself tells a complex story. And the artists themselves went through a complex evolution. By looking at it more closely, you get uh, just an interesting story of Ukraine, 20th century Ukraine. Uh, and uh, and how today's memory wars and uh, contested memory can be can be can be analyzed and can be described by looking at the art.